Andy, my dude, have you heard of the magical website builder known as Squarespace? Ugh, not another Squarespace ad. I feel like every podcast is sponsored by them. <laughs> Hey, don't knock it till you try it. Yes, okay, it is overhyped. But actually, it lives up to the hype. Squarespace is like a website fairy godmother. With a click of a button, your site transforms into a beautiful masterpiece. A website fairy godmother? That sounds interesting. What makes it so magical? Well, for starters, those slick templates make anyone look like a professional web designer. Pick one, customize the colors and fonts to match your brand, and voila! Plus, the drag-and-drop fluid engine is so easy, your grandma could build a site on Squarespace. Well, she did knit me a lovely scarf last Christmas. Maybe website design is next. Exactly. And when you're ready to sell your Nana's handmade scarves online, Squarespace has built-in e-commerce. Add a store with one click, get flexible payment options, then watch those sales roll in. And when she wants to teach others her steezy scarf skills, Squarespace's new courses feature is just the ticket. Nana can set up her curriculum and enrollments and payments in a snap and become the next e-knitting influencer. Oh, wow, you really sold me with the grandma angle. Sign me up for that free try. Just go to the nextreel.com slash Squarespace and transform your site into a beautiful Squarespace masterpiece. Well, thanks, Pete. Even though it's overhyped, Squarespace actually sounds perfect for Nana's site's needs. Appreciate the warning on the ads, though. I'll brace myself next time I listen to a podcast. Anytime. Let me know if you need any help getting that site up and running. Andy, can you believe we've almost hit 700 episodes of The Next Reel? I know, it's crazy. And with all the other episodes in our family of podcasts, we are well over 1,200 episodes of movie conversation. It's really pretty amazing that we've gotten to have these in-depth movie chats every week for over a decade now. And we couldn't have done it without our loyal community of film fans. Their support over the years has meant so much. For sure. That reminds me, we should give the merch store a shout out. Buying shirts from thenextreel.com slash merch is a great way listeners can continue to support the show. Plus, they get to support our great designs. Absolutely. I think sometimes folks forget we have a variety of shirts, mugs, phone cases, and more available. In fact, a great place to start is with a shirt sporting the Next Reel's logo. We also have that classic Fast Times Spicoli Surf School tee. Or the weirdly popular Rusty's European Tour shirt. The one from National Lamp Foods European Vacation. Why is that so popular? <laughs> Search me, but we have sold a ridiculous number of those. I guess there are a lot of Rusties taking trips to Europe? We're always adding new designs based on movies we've covered, like our brand new design for a streetcar named Desire, featuring a streetcar named Desire. So if you want to rep your love of TNR and films... Head to thenextreel.com slash merch. Every purchase helps us continue to have these weekly in-depth conversations. So visit thenextreel.com slash merch today. And as always, thanks for listening and being a part of the Next Real community. We've got lots more great movie chats coming your way. I'm Pete Wright. And I'm Andy Nelson. Welcome to the Next Real. When the movie ends, our conversation begins. In just a matter of seconds, you're going to hear a classic episode of this show from back in the day when we called ourselves Movies We Like. It took us a while to settle into the show's format, so you'll notice some differences as you listen to these episodes. For instance, it takes us a bit of time to actually get into the conversation about the movie. Things like that. But we're still proud of the conversations about the movies themselves, and we think they're worth keeping in the library. So enjoy these episodes from our back catalog. And you can become part of our Discord community, learn more about the show, and find out how you can become a supporting member at thenextreel.com. So thank you, everybody, for downloading and listening to The Next Reel. We appreciate your time and attention, and we hope you enjoy the show. My life is a blank, Pete. Boy, this is riveting podcasting right here. This is the next reel on Rashpixel.fm, everybody. I'm Pete Wright. And that right there is Andy freaking Nelson. 
Ah! And we spoil movies. Tonight on the show, the final film in our series celebrating David Mamet as screenwriter with the Woodland remake of the hit sea thriller Jaws the Revenge. Yes, it's Lee Tomahori's 1997 The Edge. Before we get into that, you should learn more about us at thenextreel.com. Subscribe to the show on iTunes or follow us on Twitter and Facebook at The Next Reel. And if you've ever felt the urge to take on a Kodiak with your bare hands and a couple of pointy sticks... You should head over to the next reel's Instagram hashtag Pony Prize hashtag Guess the Movie Challenge. And with that, let's check in with Stephen Smart, who finally made his way back to civilization thanks to his trusty paperclip as a compass trick. Hey guys, in Andy's excitement at at Fake Fay winning after thirty five minutes, he forgot to the previous week's winner and movie. The movie was Laura from 1944, directed by Otto Preminger and starring Jean Tierney, uh, Vincent Price and Dana Andrews. At Brendo61 guessed it on Image 2, so congrats, you're entered into the 2016 Pony Prize hat. As always, challenges start on Monday, so thanks guys and see you later. And we've got some uh, follow-up. we got some follow-up, and this is gratifyingly fantastic follow-up. It really on, is. Uh, uh, from uh, our, our good friend of the show, Ben Lott, in the Blot Spot. He said, you guys totally nailed every opinion I had about Glengarry Glen Ross. It's pretty impressive that this movie manages to make these slimy salesmen so sympathetic that I was rooting for people to get tricked by them. That is really why Alec Baldwin's speech has to be so dramatic and powerful, because he raises the stakes and also makes Mitch and Murray the bad guys. Every single actor was superb. I liked it a lot. Your rank 66, my rank 64. That feels pretty good. It's like, why bother having an opinion for yourself uh, when we can... (laughs) We can just do it for you. Uh, Andy, I think it's time. Let's do trailers. Let's do it. My trailer, Pete. Yes, sir. Looks really cuckoo. Cuckoo, uh, (laughs) but really fun. And it's hard to say too much about it because at this point, it's just a teaser. This is a hunt for the wilder people. Directed by Taika Waititi, who also, tied to tonight's show, hails from New Zealand. Oh, connections. Mm, Connections, Mm -hmm. yes. Uh, And uh, this is a film that I believe is playing at Sundance uh, very soon. Uh, But Taika Waititi has been behind some other films such as uh, Eagle vs. Shark. I believe was his kind of breakout film. And then he did some of the Flight of the Concords episodes, which that is just a, such a funny show. Yes. He did a film, Boy, and then he did some TV with Super City and The Inbetweeners. And then uh, a couple of years ago, he did What We Do in the Shadows, which was another one that just, uh, I still haven't caught that one, but that was one that I really was looking forward to seeing. Uh, he directed that with Jermaine Clement and... Uh, I think those two are a little bit kind of connected at the hip with some of these projects. Um, and then, of course, there's this. And now he's in pre-production on Thor Ragnarok. So he's definitely a name worth talking about. I I don't even know what to make of this. It's it's like a cross between um, children or, or what's the uh, uh, not children of the corn. Please not children of the corn. What was the, <laughs> the Lord of the Flies and Jackass. And it's in New Zealand. Well, it's something, and you know, I should say the plot of this is a national manhunt is ordered for a rebellious kid and his foster uncle who go missing in the wild New Zealand bush. <laughs> it looks really, it looks really funny. I just don't know what to make sense of it. It looks like a bad grandpa. Uh, the the <laughs> kind of the kid just does horrible things. Well, uh, yeah. And, and the, the yeah. line at the end totally just, I think, <laughs> sums it up when the cops come on screen. One time he walked really slowly across the pedestrian crossing and held up all the traffic. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> just so how rebellious this good. kid is. So good. Uh, I'm looking forward to it. When does it, uh, when are we going to be able to see it in a reasonable uh, time? I don't know if they've uh, really announced a release date for this one since it's just uh, popping up in uh, Sundance at this point. Hmm. So, yeah, Sundance, I think it actually just premiered at Sundance a couple days ago. And I think it's probably in a position where it's, uh, you know, in negotiations trying to figure out who's going to actually distribute this thing and, and get it out there. But here's hoping we get some release for this one because it looks really fun. It really, really does. Um I uh, so uh, did you did you watch mine? I did. What do you what do you think? 
<laughs> it's, uh, I guess it's everything I wanted in in a John Wick <laughs> spoof right? remake. <laughs> I, of course, am doing the very first feature film from Keegan-Michael Key and Jordan Peele uh, since they quit their fantastic uh, show, Key and Peele. Uh, I, this is from director uh, Peter Atencio. It is a story of friends who hatch a plot to retrieve a stolen cat by posing as drug dealers for a street gang. And it's much more interesting than the premise allows. The cat, first of all, is adorable. Uh, It is a wee kitten. And we should say, yes, it's a kitten. (laughs) It is a wee adorable kitten. But these guys, uh, Key and Peele play these play guys who like live in the burbs, like they they live in the suburbs and they drive minivans. And and uh, so this is very much a race story. Uh, It is them having to go into sort of thug life and they have to uh, they it's them trying to interact with these uh, with these, you know, gangsters. And and uh, uh, it, it is. Uh, a hysterical sort of uh, fish out of water story. Uh, Will Forte is he plays one of the uh, drug dealers, and and he is always funny. Um, so I I am really looking forward to it. We posted the Red Band trailer on the site. You've got to watch it, but uh, put on the headphones uh, if you're at work. It is a delightful search for kitten story in Gangland. That and John Wick would make a great, uh, just a double feature. <laughs> yes. Yes, it would. I may have to do that. <laughs> you see the, the tagline? Uh, <laughs> kitten, please. <laughs> it looks so good. Uh, Peter Atencio, I should say, is oh, yes. uh, he is a, the, the director behind... Uh, he's, he's done one episode of Last Man on Earth. I assume that's how he... Uh, has worked with Will Forte before, but he is um, also from Fort Collins, Colorado. Boom! Crazy. Mm-hmm. Did you know him? Did you grow up with him? Totally. What is he? What's his favorite food? He likes uh, uh, chimichangas, beef chimichangas. Because <laughs> that's a at the that's big taco, in, in taco Fort shack. Fun. Big in Fort Ta- Fun. Taco, taco shack. shack. There, yeah. Yeah, he's a little younger than you. Nineteen eighty-three. Yeah. There. Wow. So, um, does it make you question what you do with your life every day? Oh, shut up. <laughs> <laughs> you had to go there. Now we're just being mean. <laughs> Andy, the billionaire? Is that who you are? A photographer with an eye for beauty. Okay, great. Let's do one more. Nice looking lady. Your wife? Yes. Why'd you ask? A man of wealth who lives through books. Charles knows everything. Got a question to ask him. I seem to retain all these facts, but putting them to any useful purpose is another matter. Each the essence of the civilized man. Well, Charles, we're going on an impromptu adventure. You come too. Well, all that money, never knowing what people value you for. And I think your wife's pretty cute too. So, how are you planning to kill me? Hey, Pete, yeah. when are you going to buy me a pocket knife that costs $950? <laughs> I thought it was even more. Oh, that was the watch. That was yeah, the pocket watch was 2800 and the other watch was 2700 That's uh, That's some serious jewelry money around, this, around these parts. One <laughs> does not just drop that kind of money on jewelry in my house. So the, prim- the Edge, we're talking about The Edge tonight. 1997, mm. Lee Tamahori, starring Anthony Hopkins, Alec Baldwin, Bart the Bear, and uh, written by David Mamet. This is the last film in our series of David Mamet uh, penned films, not directed by. And um, it is, uh, it's a story of uh, old men and a bear and how they come to terms with one another's loneliness as they face the elements and their own fears and discover the secret to life is learning to love. Plus affairs. <laughs> Plus affairs. And- <laughs> Uh, Andy, my contention is this is a fundamentally broken movie. I did not enjoy it. I am stunned once again that uh, my worldview on some of these films so dramatically uh, departs from the collective worldview on this film. How Ebert gave this three out of four stars blows my mind. I was bored. It's a film that doesn't know what it is, doesn't know what it's doing. 
Uh, it, it changes tone uh, enough times that you're never really able to build intensity to the point of being thrilled if it's a thriller, scared if it's, uh, you know, any sort of, a, of an action um, kind of flick. It's, I'm, I'm not energized by this movie, and I think uh, Anthony Hopkins just sort of uh, trips through the film. It's almost as if he didn't know he was making the movie. They just turned on the camera. <laughs> And just watched him. I, I, I really, honest to God, there are some sequences in the opening thing that I felt like maybe that was the behind the scenes camera that they just had on his face. And it, he's staring off into the middle distance uh, as if he, he missed a methadone treatment. I mean, it was it was terrible. It's it is interesting. <laughs> it, well, no, speaking specifically of Anthony Hopkins, I think he made some really strange uh choices as an actor in this particular film. Now, I think that there are some moments that I actually do enjoy him um uh, quite a bit. Uh, you know, I actually I actually do like the way that he uh when the owner of the f- of the little cabin that they're at kind of hits him up for money. I actually really like the, his reaction to that and how he kind of pulls away and 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 uh changes there. I like that bit. But I think you're right. For the most part, like especially at the beginning of the film, when when he's out of his element, and I mean, I think the film aptly was uh, originally titled "Bookworm," which I think uh, may have made more sense to have just left the title that way, as opposed to trying to come up with something that was edgier. You know, I <laughs> I, I disagree with you because I think a movie about a guy who just reads books is even less interesting than a, a movie about <laughs> edges of other things. <laughs> well, let's just say there's there's more meat to the title than the generic title of The Edge. At least Bookworm fair. gives me something that, to go that's with. That's fair. That's fair. But but his character was so it was it was it was like he was slightly off the whole time at the very at the at the whole first, you know, act of the film. I I just kept writing in my notes. I'm like his his weird jumpiness that he had. You know, he had odd reactions uh, when people would comment about him, and, it, and just the way he would jump or turn, and and then he had these weird uh, like pauses. And and I, I think you kind of already alluded to just the way that he was kind of reacting in his scenes. He just it, it was just, it was a strange acting choice, and then hence it was a strange directing choice by Lee Tamahori to let him play it that way because it just it for me it just kept pulling me out of the film going why is he acting that way that's such a strange way to act i think that i may have actually found more enjoyment in this film than you did but i still don't think that it was that good of a movie um it's i mean i i Nice. I think there are elements that I like, and I, I look forward to kind of talking through the stuff that I like versus don't like with you, because it seems like you just don't like any of it. Well, and I, you know, for a movie I don't like, I've got page after page of notes here, and and um, well, look, I even drew a little gravestone there. Um, it, it, it's <laughs> this is um, is that for Harold? Here lies Steve. He failed to listen to foreshadowing. <laughs> yes. <laughs> An entire act full of foreshadowing, <laughs> and and missed every single one, every <laughs> single one. Uh, so I, I I think we should start with Mammoth. This is a Mammoth series. Let's. Uh, this is how we we get into the film. How well does Mammoth uh, does Mammoth come through in this movie? Well, once again, I just really don't hear the Mammoth speak. There's no Mammoth speak in this film. I think there are some some conversational elements and confrontational elements that he has going on between some of the characters really between the uh, the two principals your protagonist and antagonist Charles and Bob uh, played by Anthony Hopkins and Alec Baldwin that's where most of it comes out um, and it seems to come out in uh, really when Bob decides to uh, randomly I'm gonna kill Charles now out here in the wilderness <laughs> and Boom. Yeah, that, that kind of drop the mic. <laughs> that's right. Surprise! I really brought you out to kill you. <laughs> so bad. <laughs> but that's that kind of uh, you. You get a little bit more, um, just a mammoth kind of thing going back and forth. But 
on the whole, it's just not present. Other than the fact that I've already said with this series, this is really a series about men in crisis situations trying to figure out how to survive. Yeah, that's absolutely. I absolutely agree with that. I couldn't help thinking that uh, you brought it up the last couple of weeks, and I, you know, you're right on with that. But my thesis is here that Mamet just doesn't belong in the wilderness. Um, I, I feel like you're right. Some of the conversational elements, and I think they take place mostly in the beginning when they're all still happily taking pictures at the uh, at the house in the woods, um, and and much of it is uh, from. Alec Baldwin's character, who I find wholly unbelievable uh, as a New York photographer, <laughs> even in in you know 1997. I mean, there's just not enough Annie Leibovitz in him. I mean, he just is, he just can't, he just doesn't, he's not that. You know, he's really exceptionally good at playing certain archetypes, right? I mean, I absolutely loved his character. What was his character's name? Jeb Hill, I think, in Malice. You know. You ask me if I have a God complex, I tell you I am God. You know, that was an incredible monologue, and he just nails it. Obviously, we've already talked about uh, his uh, his uh, soliloquy in uh, uh, Glengarry Glen Ross last week. This film has none of the richness, none of the maniacal depth that Alec Baldwin is is absolutely adept at playing. Uh, and it asks him to do things and stretch in a way that's just weird. Yes, I, I think that his bit as the photographer is pretty weak. I think that um, a lot of the stuff that that he's scripted to do, I think he he doesn't carry very well. I actually think that his breakdown that he has in the in the field after watching the helicopter go by, I actually felt that was actually a fairly strong scene. I liked that bit, and I did actually like some of him after um, after Charles saves him and pulls him out of the deadfall um but on the whole i think i think you're right i think mammoth really struggled i my impression of of watching this film and and of what i thought mammoth was trying to do is that he said okay i'm going to do a survival story and i'm going to put man versus nature and going to have this these two guys um three guys four guys brought to three brought to two as they try to survive in the wilderness but there's also this antagonistic relationship between the two men who survive, and not only do they have to survive nature, they have to survive each other. And I think that was what Mamet was really pushing here, and I, I find myself much more involved in the man versus nature story, particularly when it involves Bart the Bear. That second act, which is all Bart the Bear, I have so much more fun watching. I get more out of that bit. I find a lot more... Um, just interesting elements in that to watch, and it is more engrossing. It's the uh, it's when they finally confront and kill the bear. When and, and I understand there's a character change uh, brought through that for Charles, but at the same time, what that does for the whole third act is it puts it back in the hands of Charles and Bob, and then that's when it brings into this whole uh, murder story. You know, I'm going to kill you because I, you, your, your wife, you don't deserve that hot wife, sort of thing. And then it just it kind of devolves into some nonsensical bits. So I, I just I, I think that Mamet was trying to come up with something interesting, but I just I couldn't quite figure out exactly what he was trying to do here. Right. It is too. It's too many little pieces of things. To make one coherent story, I and 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 tell me, that, I mean, I'll tell you where I. Well, I lose the thread in the in the opening, uh, the opening night. Right, everybody gets there and they all go to bed, and El McPherson, who is the younger uh, model wife of the rich billionaire, uh, Mickey Moore's. Please, Mickey what? Moore's. What? <laughs> really. <laughs> I, is that even what? What was the intention of Mickey Morse? Is I, that supposed to be funny? It's ridiculous. I have no idea if he was maybe trying to make a comment on his opinion of of models and modeling. I I really couldn't figure out what he was trying to do by giving her that name. Ridiculous. She says, "Mickey Morse, could you get me a sandwich?" He goes downstairs, and there is. This, this is at bedtime. This is at bedtime. When it's, you tell your children, if you eat another sandwich, right? you're going to have to go brush your teeth again. <laughs> you're going to have a stomach ache. You're going to be up all night. 
this is so she says as she is getting into bed and tucking herself in and pulling the covers around her neck she says go get me a sandwich which is such an insipid bit of screenwriting right i mean you're you teach this that is that's ridiculous it is like that's not a thing that people do it's just not a thing that people do and people recognize that as not a thing people do and it seems wildly out of character but that leads to a sequence that is edited in complete thriller style dark uh, uh, high contrast lighting and it's uh quick cuts between him trying to make a cheese and tomato sandwich and then he looks over and the door is creaking and then he looks over and there <laughs> like out of nowhere with no setup there is a giant uh a giant like roast sitting on the counter in the middle of the night well, no, it it's, is it's a, dark it's a ham hock he's making he's making a ham sandwich he does but put he slices get, of that on the sandwich did he, he didn't get it out we don't see him get it out <laughs> that's that's attributed to really poor directing it's and the, editing the phantom ham <laughs> it is the phantom ham and the the and it keeps cutting back and forth between the phantom ham and the phantom door creaking open and then the phantom the sandwich that because you didn't see him get the ham out all you think he's making is a tomato and cheese sandwich right it is bizarre and then it, he goes over and he says well as long as this ham's sitting out on the counter i might as well take a couple of slices he comes in and there boom he opens the door alec baldwin's dressed as a bear and it's a it's a gag it turns out it was all a joke <laughs> uh to scare him he breaks a lot of dishes nobody is concerned about that uh hopkins as he falls into a, a break front and uh then they all uh they all exchange uh, some gifts that uh i i have a real problem with that sequence uh, it is terribly edited, and I can't believe it. the film was released with such a weird visual hole in it. I mean, it, it is, it, it's just terrible. Well, and it just, you know, story-wise, it just doesn't fit either. And aside from trying to create this tension, there, it just, it ends up, like, for me, the thing that, that was raised in my head as this, this odd question was like, okay, we just set up, they're out in the middle of nowhere. We see this, this generator running. We've got the, the guy who owns the, the cabin out here. We've got his generator running to power the place up. We see the generator get shut down and, and the power in the house drains out. And then all they have left is just their lanterns and everything. And then perfectly timed when, when they do the big surprise, they turn all the lights on again. I'm like, well, they, they don't have any power in the house <laughs> that's anymore. Right, that's such a it's, good point. I was so mad at Al McPherson <laughs> that I didn't even bring that up. You're absolutely right. Okay, but I'm, I'm going to tell you, that's actually not the worst thing for me. Okay. I was, even, I was even able to let that go. Let's just say I was able to let that go. Let's pretend. They they go out in the into the they do their shoot and it leads them to oh my gosh we need to find this random guy in a in a picture because he's going to be the male model this random hunter Native American hunter and I'm going to go take his well where is he well he's up in the woods we got to take a plane to go get him so now we have our setup for uh, the men to go to nature right deep into nature right they. <laughs> They run into birds, and we know they're going to run into birds because not 45 seconds before we'd heard them say, beware of bird strike, and then they have bird strike. Like, that is that is a hallmark of this film. The foreshadow <laughs> is immediately executed, immediately, completely, and thoroughly executed uh, throughout the film. So they crash land. The pilot dies. Now there are three, right? We're left with uh, Anthony Hopkins, Alec Baldwin, and Harold Perrineau. Uh, who is sadly the best thing in this film, and he, uh, may he rest in peace. Uh, token black guy gets killed. Token, that's all I have to say. That's right. It's ridiculous. Uh, so he does this wonder. This was the only thing I remembered about this film from the first time I saw it, was he does the, the compass trick, right? He puts the, the pin on the leaf in the convenient, hold, like hollowed out trunk of a tree after rubbing it on magnet, and it finds a direction. Right, find south. But Andy, please tell me how these guys could find a direction south that is a straight line toward a mountain, and they could end up in a circle back where they started. Well, and that was a note I wrote, because <laughs> I'm like, why are they blaming this on the compass? Because... 
clearly this whole mess that they had. I mean, they ran into a bear and and they just clearly weren't paying attention anymore. And yet they blame the whole thing on the compass and the fact that he has no idea what he's doing. And it's just like, I don't know. I, I thought that that whole thing was really ridiculous that they would that they would end up back at the exact same camp that they had left earlier in the film. I mean, that felt like a plot device saying, hey, we need a way to show very easily for a dumb audience that they've been walking in a big circle. Their their failure was incredibly precise. Oh, this really? This is yeah. a giant, terrifying wilderness. And they spent a day and a night, right? There was an overnight oh, in there. Oh, yeah. Think, they, right? they sleep on top of the mountain. They sleep on top of the mountain. And what happens then is that they wake up in the morning and go back the direction from whence they came. That none of these three men noticed that they had seen some of these things before. That right. It's awful. And so that's where I give up on the film. And so, um, you know, I, I was frustrated by that. It's sort of the transition into the second act where we, we're dealing more with the bear. And it's it's just, uh, uh, it, it has completely lost me. I, I was looking at Mamet's uh, filmography, just trying to sort out like where he was in his in his place at the time when he was doing this, and I wish that he could have found some bits. Like, what, did he get paid to write this? Was this something he wrote on spec and sold to the studios? I couldn't find anything out. What I do know is that he di- he uh, was directing the Spanish Prisoner the same year that that this came out. So. I don't know if this was a case of, hey, I just need to, you know, cash something in with Hollywood in order to, um, uh, to get my little project out, you know, off the ground. But at the same time, he was also writing Wag the Dog, which is a great film. So it's just one of those things where it's just like I couldn't figure out if if this was the the quick and easy one that he kind of threw out there to kind of get a little extra money had this been floating around hollywood for 10 years and nobody wanted it because it was weak like i couldn't find any information on that so i was very curious about it but it just felt like weak mammoth and i just i feel like it's interesting because after this came out in 97 the spanish prisoner now mammoth had directed things uh, as early as 87 with house of games but he really it seemed like he really kind of after this in 1997 took off and that's when he had kind of a big run of directing stuff. And I, I was wondering if like maybe that was because he was kind of a little tired of seeing um, what Hollywood was doing with some of the scripts that he was writing. And, and, right. and, I, and I think of this script immediately because of that. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I'm, I'm curious because I think you, when we talked last week, I had not watched it yet. And I think you were more bullish on this film. Like, did you, were you surprised when you watched it? I was. I mean, I remember liking it more. I, I thought there was some good stuff. And I guess I remembered a lot more of the bear stuff. And I thought the ending was different. Um, my wife made it through half of it. And then she's just like, yeah, this is pretty formulaic. And then she just went off to bed. <laughs> that was about it. I'm like, yeah, it really is. You know, it's just, it's just, you know, setting stuff up and, and uh, it's got all the stuff laid out for us. And it just kind of was following it uh, by the letter. And so. I, and it was just, it was, I mean, I still did enjoy elements of it. I think there are interesting bits in there, but none of those interesting bits are strong enough to make a good film. Let's talk about Lee Tamahori. We've, we've talked Holy. about Lee Tamahori before, right? No. Oh, you're right. It was the other, it was your other guilty pleasure. <laughs> I get next and that other oh, thing. Oh, come on. Confused. I will say... <laughs> I didn't think next was all that bad. I I don't know if I'd go so far as to say it's a guilty pleasure, but I was, <laughs> <laughs> but I, I I would say I did feel guilty for actually enjoying anything about it because <laughs> <laughs> that that fits. I, yeah, I guess it's a very light. It's a guilty pleasure light. I guess <laughs> this was. <laughs> Lee Tom Horry uh, has has brought us uh, other films. Along came a spider, um, which Mulholland uh, Falls. M- Mulholland Falls. Um, he's uh, Die Another Day. I know is one of your very favorite uh, Bond films, right? It's at the top of your list, right? Oh, I'm sure that's that's just the bottom, bottom of the barrel, baby. <laughs> yeah, I, I you know. I never saw Once Were Warriors. That was the film that really kind of uh, was the breakout film for Lee Tomahori about uh, the the uh, um, 
it was what the urban story of the Maori, yeah, the Maori uh, warriors, right? Warriors in a kind of urban in the urban uh, New Zealand, and I, I I can see why a story like that would kind of uh, be a breakout because it sounds like an interesting story. But since then, I just don't think he's really found his stride. Mulholland falls the edge. Along came a spider, die another day. Triple X, State of the Union. Next, The Devil's Double. Uh, he's got a couple films in post production, but I, you know, I don't know. I, I watching this film, I didn't get a se- and and a number of his other films. I don't have a sense that he has a strong ability to read everything that's that's folding into a story to make sure that it's leading down the right path to tell a cohesive whole. Uh, so cinematography. Here's the problem. This is this thing was primarily shot on location in Banff National Park in Alberta, Canada. It's a beautiful place. How is it, Andy, that they somehow made this thing look like a manufactured backlot to me? What how is that possible? It's interesting. Uh, and I mean Donald McAlpine is a great DP. He's done some really fantastic uh projects and I don't know exactly, um, I I don't know. I I don't think I have the same issues you do with the landscape. There are, I can think of two or three scenes specifically where it really did feel like a a backlot set. And I, I actually thought that, and I was like, boy, okay, probably they put this here on a backlot set to make it look like the rugged outdoors because Hopkins, uh, you know, they didn't want to have him walking across the top of a mountain or something like that. At its worst, it even looked green screen in some sequences. Yeah, it's it's interesting that they did this. I mean, the plane crash and everything, that was all shot with an actual uh, on, on wire rig. They had this aerial crew uh, bringing this wire rig of this plane and that they dropped into the lake. I mean, they actually did all this stuff real. And it in at times it really does look just kind of phony baloney and it's interesting that uh that it fell to that and i don't know i feel like a lot of that again falls to the director not having a good sense of where to place the camera how to make it look how to find the right feel for things uh i mean i think donald mcalpine has an incredible amount of output that shows that he knows how to make things look great, whether it's some of his films from his early days back in Australia um, or some of his more recent things that he's done, um, Clear and Present Danger, Patriot Games, Moulin Rouge, uh, X-Men Wolverine, uh, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, Ender's Game. I mean, he's got a strong body of work. He knows how to make stuff look good. Maybe it's a pairing of the two of them. He needs a good director to um, to help shape the right image. And then the director needs to be able to also figure out what the heck to do with, with the image that he's presented with. I, you know, it, you, it, you start to kind of pull together this, this film. It starts to look like just uh, the film that everybody kind of just, it was just the wrong mix, you know, the wrong mix of everyone. From the well, and, script to the director to the you know visuals to the clearly the effects. I mean, it goes right to the the very opening shot of the film is a worm's eye view of the tail of the airplane as they get off of it. Now, yes, it's an interesting perspective uh, of a plane that we don't see too often in film. But what is the storytelling purpose of that shot? What is Tom Horry and McAlpine trying to say by putting the camera there and showing us the plane? That's what's missing from this film is there's not a sense of why the camera is where it is. And that is the problem. Yeah, it, it's, uh, it, you know, when you're, when you're, I don't know, for me, the movies that are most satisfying to me are the movies that, that do these kind of crazy things with the camera. They make good on a promise by, by, by sort of giving you the punchline of why they gave you the funky view when you opening, when you open the film, uh, before, like immediately after, like we're, we're setting up a world here that you're going to need to become accustomed to, um, experiencing in this way. Uh, and, you know, I look back to, uh, Delicatessen. Right where we we end sure. up with the uh, with the trash can eye view uh, of the world around him, and that ends up making good on a promise of the threat of the escape and of the visual style that we're about to see. 
This film makes no such good on any such promise. Absolutely not. Even even what uh, the same director did with Alien Resurrection, that had more sense with the storytelling style going on through the film, as much as I uh, have problems with that film. Right, right. The production design, uh, uh, too. Wolf Kroger, he's behind First Blood and Casualties of War and We're No Angels and Last of the Mohicans. And these are films that, whether they are establishing small kind of woodland communities in First Blood and We're No Angels to, you know, villages in war zone um, to, you know, my goodness, Last of the Mohicans is uh, uh, epic production this ends up feeling like a, a weird Disney experience, right? When they end up on the aband- in the abandoned cabin in the third act, it really feels like um, you're uh, like the entrance to the log ride. <laughs> I, I mean, I don't think I had as much a problem with the production design as you did, um, but, but you're not far off. <laughs> I'll give you that. <laughs> Oh, that's too funny. I don't know. Uh, talk about Alec Baldwin's beard, a character in its own right. Well, uh, you know, funny story is, uh, you know, Art Linson, the producer on this, um, has a book out called What Just Happened. And it was kind of uh, a story of his time in Hollywood. I, I think the, what is the full title of it? I got to find the full title. But um uh, what just happened? Bitter Hollywood tales from the front line, and it was really just kind of chronicling his stories of things that he struggled with over the course of his career and and, and problems he had with actors and everything. And actually, Barry Levinson made a film out of that in two thousand eight. I don't think it was received very well, but I did watch some scenes uh, from it to get a sense of it, and uh, I thought they were pretty funny. So I, I may watch this. Um, Robert De Niro plays the Art Linson character. Um, and named Ben in this film, but it has uh, a Bruce Willis, uh, Bruce Willis playing himself as Bruce Willis, but he's really kind of playing Alec Baldwin <laughs> from The Edge, because the story in the book is that Alec Baldwin had this beard that he grew, and he wouldn't get rid of it, and he was convinced that people will know who I am, it's his artistic vision, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. and and I, I don't know. I mean, because obviously they did get him to shave it for the film. I mean, he has his beard only for kind of the end of the film. At the beginning of the film, he's nice, cleanly shaven, and we see him kind of grow his facial hair over the course of it. But it was a uh, an issue that these guys had to deal with. And Alec Baldwin apparently was was crazy enough to become this really crazy Bruce Willis character in the film. And the scene with Bruce Willis... Uh, arguing with Robert De Niro about his beard is quite funny. So uh, it's, uh, yeah, it's interesting. These are the sorts of things that go into making movies, folks. You know, the the what this highlights for me, because, you, I mean, you actually, I think, paint it really gently, that he, it <laughs> looks as if he grows the beard, you know, over time. It To me, it is not that. I mean, he has the beard at the end. He didn't have the beard in the beginning. And Anthony Hopkins appears to have been trimming over the course of his, you know, wilderness adventure, his beard looks perfect uh, and well manicured. This, to me, is an an example of an egregious violation of movie time. Um, There is no sense that either of them have enough time to grow beards because they aren't really eating enough to be able to, you know, do the kind of outdoor stuff that they're doing. Uh, it, it is they they mount a really effective uh, assault on Bart the Bear uh, after apparently days of no food and uh, you know wandering in the in the wilderness where you think they would have you know succumbed to frostbite like they're. The, I, I'm no expert in outdoor living, but Andy, you know, they have masterfully made a movie that if it is true, if all of this stuff would have been possible by expert mountaineers, they managed to make it all absolutely unbelievable. Yeah, it's it, it's pretty far-fetched. And I mean, <laughs> it's funny, the beard stuff actually, if you think about it, I mean, we see them sleeping maybe, I don't know, three or four nights out in the wilderness. 
I grow hair and, like and a just, Wookie, Andy. Yeah, and no, I just, can't pull off this kind of beard. No, it's a full beard by the time we get to the end. I mean, he does have this full beard. So that's all just part of this whole thing. And that's, I mean, it's, it's really, uh, awful that this is the sort of thing that filmmakers have to deal with when an actor you know has a moment like this and you know his beard takes priority over the quality of the film but maybe it's one of those things where alec kind of had a sense that you know this film isn't going to turn out all that good so i guess i don't care that much i'd rather keep my beard yeah (laughs) who knows You hate that your film is is the movie that they're going to play that gamble. That's that's right. That's, that's right. Not good. That's right. Um, you know, we we haven't talked uh, much about Harold Perrineau. We've talked a bit about Anthony Hopkins and Alec Baldwin. Do we have anything else about the uh, uh, Charles Morris and Robert Greene characters? Um, uh, I uh, have we talked about Anthony Hopkins before on the show? I feel like we haven't. I don't think we have. No. But this is a. I, it makes me not want to belabor Anthony Hopkins because this is absolutely my least favorite film of his. I almost wanted this to be a drinking <laughs> game. Uh, every time somebody said, uh, "What do we do, Charles? Drink, right?" Like there, I actually wrote down some rules um, of what you what you should do if this had become a drinking game. Let me see if I can find them because I think this would be a good film. Every time a character says Charles. Every time Alec Baldwin says something in a stereotypically gay voice, uh, every time Hopkins says no to an otherwise really good idea, uh, I think you could end up really soused at the end of this movie. Oh, I, I think the Charles alone would do it. Yeah. I mean, there's actually a funny YouTube clip where somebody cut out um, every single line where where Charles's name is said. And it's and you <laughs> it just turns watch. out it's the whole movie. <laughs> it's just so funny. I'm like... Wow, they really did say Charles that much. They really did. <laughs> it was very, very comical. So uh, you're, you're probably right. We shouldn't t- spend too much time talking about Hopkins. It does make me feel like uh, he warrants future conversations in another series yeah. down the road. <laughs> Poor guy. <laughs> I mean, again, I'm thrilled that Anthony Hopkins got to have this experience of making this film and going out in the wilderness. And and I mean, I watched a little thing of him doing his, his the stunt of dangling off of the log and all that sort of stuff. I mean, you know, as an if I were an actor, that's the sort of stuff I would love to do, whether the film ended up good or not. You know, sometimes I guess I wouldn't worry so much about that because I would have had so much fun actually making it and going to do it in such beautiful places. So I think that's the sort of thing that I, I'm going to take away from this film saying, these actors got to have a great experience in the in the outdoors, working with Bart the Bear, doing some really fun stuff. <laughs> You're very kind. How's that? That was really good. That was really good. Now and and, let, and back to Stephen. Yes, <laughs> is that oh, where you are going? Well, I was actually going to say one more thing about uh, Alec Baldwin. Uh, first, well, a couple of things. First of all, um, he, he did. Did you notice when he is sitting uh, over there? They're hunting for squirrel. <laughs> They've made the squirrel trap, right? And and they are both uh, sitting there, hunched over, and Baldwin is over his over uh, Hopkins' shoulder, and you see this two shot, and you have Anthony Hopkins looking completely stone faced, like he is in the rest of the movie, uh, and you have uh, Baldwin who looks like Derek Zoolander, like that's who he's <laughs> channeling. He's pursing his <laughs> lips in a way that makes you think it's Blue Steel. So then after that, they they catch the squirrel. There's a squirrel in a box. And then uh, they have the uh, the you make me sick speech. You make me sick, Charles. Drink. Right. And it seems so weirdly out of context, that speech. I know this is getting back to mammoth and bad scripting, but it's weirdly out of context. Where does that come from? They just caught the squirrel, and now he's upset, and he's having his breakdown. But there's still a squirrel in a box, Andy. What about the squirrel in the box? I think the squirrel's still there. It is, because the bear showed up and they ran. And that squirrel died in that box. I feel, I feel worse for the squirrel than any of the other three in this scenario. Actually, the bear probably came back and ate him. All right. Well, circle of life. Harold. Yes. Harold Perrineau. It's great seeing, I mean, <laughs> speaking of bears in cinema, this is the perfect year to be talking about this with The Revenant out in theaters right now. Don't spoil it's just, it. Don't spoil I, it. I won't, other than the bear it's is nice. father. It's, oh, yes. It's great. This is almost like uh, relatives for, for the bear in The Revenant. You know, these are the descendants. These are those two little cubs who, 
the two little cubs grew up and they they led to this great big Kodiak that uh, takes these guys on <laughs> and and eats Harold <laughs> and eats Harold in a really undignified manner. It's good stuff. I gotta say, um, I don't know. We're watching watching Bart the Bear just thrills me to no end because this is just an amazing fifteen hundred pound animal that just blows my mind. That uh, that this this couple, Doug and Lynn Sue, so I mean, really, Doug um, raised him from the time he was born and and made this amazing animal for us to enjoy in cinema, and it just it always kind of just blows my mind when I get to see Bart um, doing just this this amazing bear stuff because it just it's it's a it's a stunning animal to look at and I would be scared to death to be in proximity <laughs> of this giant thing um, and it's amazing that uh, that he pulls some stuff off and then you see him. I mean, it's, you know, doing stuff with people like, you know, when it's whatever the dummy is of of. Uh, Harold as as uh, Bart's shaking him around but it's just like that is the sort of stuff that a real like... bear does and I just would not ever want to be near that uh, Bart the bear's first role was in 1980 in Windwalker followed up immediately by Kenny Rogers as the gambler the adventure continues uh, he of course did Clan of the Cave Bear Louis the Moors Down the Long Hills the Great Outdoors uh, which was a great role for him that was a great role. <laughs> that was a great role. The Bear, The Young Riders, Lost in the Barrens, White Fang, another good one, Giant on Thunder Mountain, On Deadly Ground, Legends of the Fall. That's uh, right. That's where he first worked with Hopkins. That's right. That's right. So they were uh, reunited in this film. This was one of his last films, the the last film being Meet the Deedles. Uh, Poor Bart. He, <laughs> he played The Bear. Uh, it's really tragic. Bart actually got cancer. And oh. uh, shortly after this film, had to have some surgery, and they uh, managed to ex- extend his life for about a year and a half, I think, uh, before it really just kind of uh, recurred and just kind of took over his body, and they had to euthanize him on May 10th, 2000, at the age of 23. Oh, wow. Yeah. Well, he had a, a fantastic career, truly. Yes, and he worked did. for most of his life. Not many actors can say that. The percentage of, in terms of IMDb credits, seriously think about that, the percentage of one's life that he was able to be earning a living as an actor. That's probably one of the highest on IMDb. Probably Bart the Bear and Jodie Foster. And Jodie Foster. (laughs) (laughs) And Kurt Russell. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. Luckily... um, the uh, couple, uh, Doug and Lynn Seuss, had, uh, I guess, uh, shortly after Bart died, I think it was, gosh, I can't remember where, uh, some park called them up and they had found two um, two uh, grizzly cubs that had their mother had been killed and they were four months old and asked if they were interested in adopting them. And so now they have Bart the Bear 2 and I think Honey Bump is his sister's name, oh, I believe. Well, that's sweet. And uh, now they are being trained to uh, to do uh, kind of follow follow Bart's footsteps. So I think that's pretty fantastic. That uh, I, I what blows me away is that this couple uh, have found this this relationship with bears and have been able to train them to actually do this sort of stuff in uh, in uh, films. It just really kind of blows my mind. That's crazy. That is crazy. Uh, we that, that brings us uh, to music. We've got another J. Another of the J's. Yes, indeed. Jerry Goldsmith. What would you think of the score? I actually like this score quite a bit. Uh, that being said, I feel like the theme is um, oft repeated. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Uh, I think this is uh, I, what was the film that we talked about recently that had the exact same problem where the film or where the theme was nice, but they just played it so frequently. Was what it, was that? Uh, it wasn't uh, Untouchables. No, no. That had a number of themes. Right, right. Um, the verdict. Was it, re- how recently was it? I remember this too. This was Feels... last year sometime. Oh, it I was? Can't remember. It wasn't quite that recently. Oh, well, then maybe I don't. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> well, whatever, whatever it was, it's it it can be a problem. And uh, I mean, that being said, I still like the theme and I like the music here. I think Jerry Goldsmith does some nice stuff with it. Um, and uh, you know, I I I give it a, a B. Yeah, I you know I found it I it's listenable. You know, I mean, I I find it uh, uh, easy to easy to take in and so you know in that regard i don't i mean i it's it's one i can put on and listen to in the background of stuff and that's that's redeeming it is certainly better than the film <laughs> so yes probably true probably true did you did you mention lq jones you know talking cast no i i didn't i i, I mean, like I, old styles i do i I don't have a lot to say about him, uh, but uh, man, he's a he's one of those actors who has been around forever, and he's got a great look. I think he's, I mean, his part is, you know, it's not a great part in this film, and uh, but uh, man, I mean, he's been around. He did a lot of stuff with Peck and Pa. Just one of those actors. He is. He's he's iconic. Boy, do you feel it? You you see him come on screen. They they scarred him up good. Yes, they did. Yes, they did. And then, the, of course, there's uh, the poor Gordon Tutusis. I don't even know how to say his name. Gordon Tutusis? I'm going to say yes. The the Native American actor who is cast in this to be nothing other than the photo and kind of the MacGuffin, I suppose you could say. He shows up at the end, right? Like he's standing on st- on the board <laughs> with styles. Oh, that's right. He is he, there right yeah, at the end. He was yeah. already, he was there. Had they just waited? <laughs> right. Sucked all the oxygen out of an already terrible script. <laughs> <laughs> it's just so bad. Uh, oh, and, and you know the whole thing. What is the deal with the with the end of the film? With with uh, you know the resolution. How did you feel first of all about the resolution of Hopkins with you know his the the redemption story that somehow sneaks in here between Hopkins and Baldwin's characters. Uh, and then the resolution, such as we are able to see, of Hopkins and his wife. I actually, that is an element of the film that I actually like. I like this this odd change in this man who's kind of, he has kind of grown through this the course of this. And, and I like that he, I, I have a feeling that when he kind of, um, uh, I, I want to say he tricks Bob into falling into the deadfall, but really it's just like he's trying to protect himself from getting shot and Bob falls into the deadfall. I like that he ends up saving Bob's life and and actually works to kind of get him out. I think that's actually a really interesting character element in the film that I do like quite a bit. And I like the resolution. I like the the way that the bit at the end is is relatively underplayed between him and his wife. I think that's that's kind of nice. I mean, Elle McPherson has never, I mean, I think there's a reason she's a model, um, uh, maybe not uh, an actress. I, But, I mean, you know, she's I, fine. She does the part okay. I think she did, too. She was, she, in, in fact, uh, given how I feel about the rest of the film, I had few problems with her, and I really actually liked her stoic at the end, you know, like the, the you know, the, the her awareness that, in fact, she is, um, you know, she's been found out after all of this, like she lost her she lost her photographer and her paramour and the assistant uh and there's all this horrible stuff and now she knows that even though she got her husband back she's also lost him uh that's how i'm walking away with the film yeah uh, from the film. and she and she'll never get to see those those awful native american photos that they were taking of her so so <laughs> tone deaf like how did that how is that even a choice i don't know now I know that I'm. There, I know that's David def- now. That well, I'm, yeah. I know that's those are the eyes that I'm. I'm viewing this film through. I, I recognize that, but uh, my goodness, <sighs> dummies. Yes, yes. Well, even just like the even Alec Baldwin's, uh, you know, homosexual mocking. It just so, all of that so rang stupid. so dated. I'm like, really? oh, ouch. <laughs> yeah, really bad. Yeah, but the ending was odd. I mean, I like I said, I do like those character elements. For me, I just, I never, I, I get tied up on the very ending, the very last line of the film. How how did they die? What happened? They died saving my life, Which that is, Char- Charles says. It's like, okay, that was 
weird. I mean, I can see he's being touched. Is he trying to say something poignant about the fact that, you know, that these guys died, they were all working together and they were trying to get out? Or the other interpretation I had is this like, is this David Mamet thinking that this is how a rich man would interpret what has happened? Like these these men, you know, they were all trying to get me out because I'm the rich, important one. I really couldn't figure out what David Mamet was trying to oh, say here. Oh God, that makes it even worse. I did not, I did not get that. Ugh. Well, Blech. and that's like I know, and it's like, and I didn't want to walk away reading that, but that's what I felt, and I'm like, is that a poor director's choice that he he didn't know what it meant, he didn't know what Mamet was trying to say, and he didn't know how to direct the actor, the actor didn't know what he was saying. I like, I really couldn't figure out what they were trying to do with that last line. There, it's just a weird line, and it just kind of put me in a place where I'm like, what the heck was that? Oh, th- yeah, it's terrible. And now it's you just made it worse. <laughs> it just just uh, sunk it a little lower. How uh, how did this do? I I told you at the beginning. I am stunned that there were are, are critics out there that actually liked this film. Well, you also have to remember uh, that when all these critics rated it. I mean, it was at the time and there are elements of the film. Like I liked this a lot more at the time it came out. I don't think I saw the problems and I think it was easier to see the problems now just because so much more time has passed. So maybe the critics were just time blind too. Okay. There's a new word for our lexicon. Time blind, right. Yes. Um, I couldn't find anything about this movie as far as its budget. I think they have buried that and it's just nowhere to be found. So I'm really curious now actually how much this movie cost to make. It only made, oh, it was about $27.8 million, which is about $40.5 million in adjusted dollars. So, you know, it, I, I can't give all of the information as far as this adjusted profit per finished minute, but uh, it did, you know, it, it made some money. I'm curious to know if it made its money back, and I'll never know. Well, maybe that's as it should be. <laughs> Maybe. And so we shall never speak of it again. <laughs> uh, all right, Andy, I think we should probably rank it. Let's do it. Head over to flickchart.com slash the next reel. Uh, sign up for an account if you don't have one. If you do, just log in and uh, go ahead and search for The Edge, and then you're going to rank it. Say, add to my flick chart, and you, it will, you'll go into the, into the zone with us right now. And That's a cue. That was a cue. I know I'm coming in and I there like I said there are elements I like in this film like some of the character bits I do like that but are you pre are you pre-justifying any of the wins that you're going to give this is that what you're you're pre-apologizing I'm I'm just saying it's not going to end up at the bottom of my list but I don't think it's going to get very high (laughs) (laughs) I just I don't want people to walk out thinking man they really hated that one I think that there is a lot of dislike with this film. Andy, and I want there... people to walk out with that feeling. I know you, you do. Finish your sentence. Sorry. <laughs> okay. That's good. But uh, there are elements that worked. I just think on the whole, it really kind of was a mess. All right. So there you go. The Edge or Oh Brother, Where Art Thou? I think we can both um... safely say Oh Brother, Where Art Thou? <laughs> oh, you. <laughs> yes, I'm going to say uh, Oh Brother. The Edge or The Sandlot? I, I will know, say The Sandlot. I, I'm going to say The Sandlot. Big Dog, Big Bear. If it were those two animals, I'd pick The Big Bear. But, I would do. <laughs> Alas. But the rest of it, yes. Uh, the Edge or Escape from New York, Pete. There, now, here's an interesting one. I actually just rewatched Escape from New York for my uh, you know, my John Carpenter re-ranking series. I'm going through all of his films. Yeah. And... I had all the same problems that we had. It's just the, there's so much weakness with the story. It's it's an interesting world that he creates. It just never takes off. I I still am going to pick it over the edge. <laughs> I am too. <laughs> Don't I mean really? I didn't. No, I, I was know, not no. a fan of Escape from New York. Uh, I know you were. Uh, okay, The Edge of the Blob, 1958. The Blob. I'm going to say The Edge, and it's really only because of Act 2 with Bart the Bear. I could easily go back and rewatch that act and really enjoy it still. I think there's an amazing amount of awesome, awesome bear work in there. So I'm going to say The Edge. Here's the thing about that. I, I think you're you're right, but it's this is one of the challenges I didn't bring up with Bart the Bear. The, the problem with Bart the Bear is that I don't find him... 
I don't find those sequences ever terribly uh, threatening, right? I, I, men- Is it because you know it's Bart? Maybe. Uh, you know, menacing. There's a little menacing. Um, there, there may be some rage growls, but I never really got the feeling that uh, Baldwin and and Hopkins were in in danger. Um, and and so that's a that's I just you know it was fun to watch Bart the Bear, and maybe it's again because I know it was Bart the Bear, but I just wow, I'm I'm still gonna have to go with the blob, Stephen Queen. Okay, all right. Well, let's uh, let's, let's settle this do as gentlemen do. All right. One, One, two, two, three, three, rock. Rock. One, One, two, two, three, three, scissors. (laughs) (laughs) I'll give you bear. (laughs) Because that was actually pretty funny. All right. The blob takes it. (laughs) But that's the only time you're going to get away with that one, mister. The edge or Princey's honor. I will do Pritzy's honor. I will do Pritzy's honor. The edge or scoop. I will do the edge. <laughs> Scar Definitely. Joe. Oh, that was such a bad movie. I will. Um, I will give you the edge. You say that one edged out a little bit. Oh God. <laughs> We're getting down to it, Pete. The edge or Children of the Corn. Edge for me. I'm gonna go with edge. The Edge or Apt Pupil, I'm going The Edge. Wow. Really? If we're down here. Mm. It's already below Strange Days, and I don't... I oh. think I would put this over Strange Days. Uh, okay, I, I'll go with, uh, apt, or with uh, The Edge. All right. Wow, 217 out of 222. That's much lower than I would have put it, but it's it's definitely <laughs> Give me a ballpark. What is the number that would have that would have satisfied you? Well, looking at our lower echelon here. <laughs> uh, let's see. I I would have uh, I mean some of these are out of order anyway. Like I think it should be below Pritzy's Honor, which it is, but I it should be above Strange Days, above Alien. Well, no, gosh, I might actually enjoy Alien Resurrection more. I know I would. So, uh, I, well, I guess maybe it's about where... I, I think it's pretty fair. I think I've just put it up above Strange Days, and I'd probably call it good there. I think Strange Days, if Except anything... Except the blob. I, yeah, I don't know. Strange Days is is one that, that could be um, re-ranked lower. I think there are some that snuck by Strange Days because they didn't get ranked against Strange Days. Right. That's not that, a good movie. No, it uh, really was... All over the place. Yeah. Big mess. Okay. But yeah, right. 217 so, on this one. What does this do, uh, pray tell, for your star rating? I, you know, like I said, I love the bear stuff in this. I think I'm at probably about a, I, I want to say a two. Yeah, I think I'll go with a two. Two stars at 217? I I didn't. I I would have brought it up a little higher than that. Oh man, I this is a this is a half star, one star movie for me. It's I give my points to I I think there are like I said some decent scenes in here, some good character moments, and Bart the Bear. So two stars. All right. Well, I'm definitely a one star movie on this. All right. Ugh. Oh I mean, well. And I need a shower. It's interesting that um, that I mean I don't know if I mean I guess Mamet yeah he just he writes all sorts of stuff but I don't think I don't know I don't think he has he written anything that's this kind of uh, crazy Hollywood since uh, since ninety seven since ninety seven uh. he did uh, let's see just writing Wag the Dog Ronin which we yeah liked which quite we've a bit. done yeah. Um, he did see. Uh, Hannibal. Hannibal. I forgot. I forgot he did Hannibal. That yeah, was a pretty which big, was terrific. Thing. Uh, oh, I really enjoyed that. I'm a yeah, huge the, fan of the I, books too. Though. I think my problem is the book with that one. I think I enjoyed it, but the book was kind of weird. You didn't. You thought the book was weird. Yeah. Oh, I really enjoyed it. Uh, let's see. He did. Uh, gosh, that's kind of it. Other than stuff that he also directed or was his own stuff so yeah not a lot yeah hmm. i you know what is this done this particular part of the 
of, of our David Mamet series, knowing that we've already touched Mamet once. Uh, what has this done to your overall impression of Mamet's work? Um, I guess my impression is that I seem to enjoy his earlier stuff more. And I seem to enjoy, um, well, I don't know. I'm a little torn. I like stuff that he's directed, except I'm not a fan of either of the films that we talked about, oddly. Um, I shouldn't, I don't know if I can even fairly say that. I mean, I've seen few of his things. House of Games, didn't care for that too much. Um, Spanish Prisoner we talked about. State in Maine, eh, didn't really care for his take on Hollywood. Heist, I liked. I remember liking Heist. That's one I would be curious to go back and revisit. Never saw Spartan. Red Belt, I wasn't crazy about. Um, so I guess of his directing, it was really Heist that is the one that kind of stood out for me. Um, as far as his writing, um, yeah, it, it's, I mean, Glenn, Gary Glenn Ross is the one that really stands out for me. Uh, and, and then like things like Ronan that he kind of, uh, uh, he did. And I don't know. I, he sort of snuck that one in. He did kind of sneak that one in. Wag the dog. I mean, he's, he's got bits and pieces of good stuff. That's the thing. I think I, I before we started digging into these as, as a series, I my impression of Mamet's work was um, was very much um, based on the few films that I had seen and really liked. Uh, obviously, I'm a big fan of Spanish Prisoner, big fan of Glenn Gary Glenn Ross, big fan of Ronan, um, uh, and yet. Uh, now that we've we've looked at more of these together and sort of refreshed my memory of the Untouchables, and my my opinion is not that it is not as high uh, because the work doesn't seem to be as consistent as my earlier impression, you know, would have had me believe. Right. I just don't. I don't feel like I get the promise of David Mamet in everything that he writes, and I you know. They're my my very favorite writers, I can say that. Even in the films that I don't necessarily like, I can I can say I I got what I needed to out of them as writers. Yeah, that's true. Mm-hmm. It really is true. I just don't think um, that he's carried it as as strongly as um, his name always made me feel like he did. Yeah, I think I think he kind of carried it based on the mammoth speak that he became so well known for in his plays from the uh, late 70s early 80s right. and i think that that kind of uh, kind of carried him for a while i'm uh, this is marks the end of this particular series andy so where do we go from here well we pete are going to do it should be a fun little series of movies in the remakes i'm quite uh, looking forward to this we're going to tackle uh, two movies and Uh, the remake of each of them. We're going to start with High Noon, fantastic film, and then we're going to do its remake, Outland, which I've actually never seen. Mm. And then we're going to do Infernal Affairs, which I've never seen, and do its remake, The Departed. Which we have seen. Which we have seen, right. I can't believe you've never seen Outland. I know, it's just one of those ones that's just kind of slipped by me. I hope this isn't this doesn't get on my guilty pleasure list. It's been a long time since I've seen it, and I do, I really like it. Well, I mean, at least we know it's based on a very quality story. I mean, High Noon is uh, pretty strong, and so I'm, I'm, I, I think it's at least got that going for it. All right. Uh, we do have some other news uh, coming up this week. So, in addition to kicking off our, our movies and their remakes series, uh, this weekend we've got uh, the finest hours. The film board gathers. We're going to be talking about uh, the Chris Pine uh, uh, rescue at sea. Uh, film The Finest Hours should be fun. Big budget boats uh, with and our Abraham ben friend Rubia. of the show, Abraham Ben Ruby from uh, last month's Speakeasy. And this month's Speakeasy, Andy, are you excited for this one? I am super, super excited. This one is coming right up Casino Royale. Ah, uh, what a movie. And uh, our very special guest is uh, visual effects artist Matthew Gratzner. And uh, he has touched a lot of movies that you know and love. I guarantee it. And he's going to be talking about not a single one of them. I can't wait. I love how he talks about this uh, this film and how yeah. he gets tied up in the uh, in the flick charting. Yes, yes, that's always fun. No, making people suffer through flick chart. <laughs> so those are the, those are the things coming up uh, this weekend and next week. 
And uh, until then, uh, I will uh, be in bed. All right. Well, I'm going to go make some fire from ice beat. Now that I know how. So I got a five star, Pete. No, Andy. How far? Yes. How long do you have to look for that? Not too long, actually. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot of love for the edge out there, Pete. Oh dear. Yes, and uh, and for this five star review, five out of five people have found it helpful. Jeez, I'm an island. Five stars. Uh, you'll be on the edge. Get that by Christine K. Cornett McVeigh. Uh, Christine says, did the Grizzly get an Oscar? He deserved one. This movie has some fantastic actors such as Hopkins and Baldwin, but the bear stole the show. After their small plane crashes, when an unexpected flock of geese come their way, three men become the hunted when a grizzly bear being tracked by locals for being a man killer picks up the crash survivor's trail. But the grizzly isn't the only danger. Hopkins has a pretty model wife that seems to be having an obsession over photographer. Alec Baldwin was the photographer plotting to kill the rich husband all along. Great scenery, fantastic action, and plot twists that keep you on the edge. Unexpected. Uh Unexpected Uh flock of geese, Christine. Really? (laughs) And I'm sorry, but the locals were trying to track the man killer bear. I don't think that's exactly the case. I think Harold became the reason that this bear started becoming a man killer. Ooh, man flesh. This tastes good. (laughs) He's been stalking us the whole time. That was my favorite line. No, like that was it. Was at the top. It was in the top, but uh, there were others. Goodness, what a film! I have a, I have a, I don't know. I think this is maybe a zero star. Ouch! I didn't even see any stars next to this one. This is uh, the title is Lamo by Dragon G. It says if you do not know anything about the wilderness or bears and believe in the tooth fairy, then you may like this movie. Otherwise, it's so hokey that it made me laugh because it is so lame. <laughs> wow. He was going so well with the Tooth Fairy bit. and then I like that. Yeah, and then he, then he just sort of ended on a whimper because it is so lame. You know, but to his point, or her point, we don't know who Dragon, Dragon, Dragon G is. Dragon G. I think the Tooth Fairy needs to be brought into more movie reviews. Probably. I think there's a real strength in that. I'm just putting it out there. Yeah. Yeah. No, and uh, the Sandman. Ah, yes. Thanks, Amazon. It is hard to believe we have been having in-depth conversations about movies since 2011. You are telling me. Producing this show week after week requires a ton of work behind the scenes. If you'd like to help support our efforts, one easy way is by using our Originals page when shopping for books and movies that we've covered. Just visit thenextreel.com slash originals. Your purchases made through our links give us a small commission at no extra cost to you and allow us to keep having these great discussions. Season 5 had some great adaptations, like our Meryl Streep Oscar-nominated performances series. We covered adaptations like Kramer vs. Kramer, Sophie's Choice, and The French Lieutenant's Woman. It's a real Sophie's Choice between those books. You see what I see what I did there? Uh, yeah. Uh, and I don't think it's quite at the level of a real Sophie's Choice. We also did Snowpiercer for our Bong Joon-ho series, adapted from the French graphic novel Le Transpersonnage. Man, I love that movie. We had our two-part 1939 series that included adaptations like Gone with the Wind, Ninochka, The Women, and The Hound of the Baskervilles. A number of those 1939 movies, like Goodbye, Mr. Chips, also tied into our recent 1940 Academy Award Best Picture nominee series. Our naughty children horror series had creepy adaptations like The Bad Seed, Village of the Damned, The Innocents, and Children of the Corn. For our Hayao Miyazaki series, we talked about his take on Lupin the Third with The Castle of Cagliostro, plus his own The Wind Rises. Some great listener choice picks, too. Viridiana and The Great Escape. And for our David Mamet Wright series, The Verdict, The Untouchables, and Glengarry Glen Ross. Plus, Kiss Kiss Bang Bang from our Shane Black series, adapted from Brett Halliday's novel, 
bodies or where you find them. Dive into the sources for all of these at thenextreel.com slash originals. Every book you buy helps support the show. Check out thenextreel.com slash originals today and find your next read. <laughs>